So good afternoon, everyone. I, I'm John Ianyan, the Director of the Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation, and it's my great honor to introduce uh, Andy Beinman, uh, Professor of Medicine, Epidemiology, and Biostatistics, and a member of the Phil Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, Andy and I have been good friends for over 20 years now, so it's a real privilege and pleasure to welcome him and welcome all of you. Uh, to this third annual director's lecture for IHPI. And we just had a great day that started actually last evening and with Andy meeting with a series of IHPI members over the course of today, uh, talking about a whole range of issues from ARC and how it's run to Medicaid policy uh, to career development issues. And it's, it, we really appreciate it, Andy, having you here with us and, and, uh, uh, and doing much more than just giving this lecture, but really getting to know us and, and the work of our members. So. Uh, Andy uh, received his medical degree from Harvard and his, excuse me, his bachelor's degree from Harvard and his medical degree from the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. Uh, he's a primary care physician at San Francisco General Hospital and a health services researcher at UCSF where he strived to improve the healthcare safety net and the people it serves. In 2009 and 2010, he was a Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellow on the staff of the U.S. House Energy and Commerce Committee, and he helped draft the legislative language for the Affordable Care Act, uh, which we hope will continue after today. Uh, and from 2011 to 2014, he was a senior advisor to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services with the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, and a senior advisor to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS. And most recently, he served as director of the U.S. Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, or HRQ, from May of 2016 through the end of the Obama administration in January. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Byman as he delivers our annual director's lecture on the outside and inside game of healthcare policy. Let's see here. Wow, what a tremendous pleasure it is to be here. Thank you so much, John, for inviting me and for all I've had a, all the people I've got a chance to meet. I've known many of you and have really always regarded this institution as a tremendous um, sibling institution to where I work at UCSF. I admire so much the work you all do, and thank you for such a, a warm welcome last evening and all day today. It's really uh, it's my honor to be able to be here. Um, it's a bit of a challenging day, I think, uh, for, for many of us who are kind of watching uh, federal health policy. Whoop, is that not working? Or? Sure that not oh, sorry. It's green. It is green. OK. Move it closer. Move, move it close. Oh, it fell down. Oh, sorry about that. How's that? Better? Better yeah. Sorry about that. OK. okay. <laughs> I said nice things about you. OK. <laughs> um, so uh, anyway, I was just saying it, it's been a bit of a challenging day today in terms of uh, not what a great schedule I've had, but kind of watching also on the iPhone uh, what some of the voting going on at, in, in the Capitol and so forth. I won't be dwelling on that so much, but um, I will really try to talk to you a little bit about my experiences trying as a health services researcher to influence health policy and then also what I observe from the inside of doing that as well. My aim is to really try to share some skills that I hope will be valuable to those of you who are also interested to use your research to inform and uh, uh, improve uh, healthcare policy uh, in the United States. So uh, uh, the um, I guess the inside and outside game is less like the Game of Thrones and a little bit more like the Matrix, I'd say. And that's both uh, meant to be a little bit of a, a joke. Uh, I mean, first of all, I am a huge fan of Game of Thrones. But uh, the, the reality is that I do think healthcare policy is much more of a complex fabric uh, in, in this country because of the uh, uh, separation of powers into uh, uh, different chambers of the Congress and the White House and, and among stakeholders uh, as well. And so I, it is a, a complex thing to be able to navigate. And I think in some ways that can be a barrier for people who want to in, engage in this process. But um, I do think it's, it is something that is, uh, can be mastered. And I think uh, it requires um, not only attention and interest, but uh, as I'll try to highlight a little bit, I think there are some uh, 
unique skills that we have to be sensitive to uh, from the academic side if we want to be more impactful in how we can move our work forward to uh, influence uh, health healthcare policy. I'm going to be talking mostly today using examples from the federal uh, health policy level, but I do think that there are um, lessons that will apply to, to state health policy as well, and I've really enjoyed uh, talking with John and, and, and many of you about the work that's going on here in state health policy, and I think it's been terrific uh, uh, and, and, and is a great way to also make an important uh, difference. So this is the kind of thing that you would sometimes see in like a, you know, a, a cartoon on the internet and so forth, which is uh, the beautiful way that uh, laws are made in, in the United States. Uh, you know, we have these three separated branches of, of government, and of course, uh, when it comes to talking about things like healthcare policy, all you have to do is to think about something like the Affordable Care Act to realize how all three have actually come into play, that of course, um, both chambers of, con uh, of Congress ultimately had to pass the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the White House not only signed uh, the legislation to turn it into a law, but then uh, you have within something like the Affordable Care Act uh, literally hundreds and hundreds of places where the phrase, the secretary shall, is within that document, which basically is a reference to the legislative body giving power over to the executive branch to fill in the details of how to actually implement the law. And uh, this is relevant, of course, because at, when you have a secretary who is aligned with the interests of uh, implementing that in a particular way, uh, that couldn't be one set of regulations, but uh, now with a change of administration and a new secretary, that can also play out in terms of, of changes of how the law can be interpreted and, t uh, and, and implemented as well. And of course, we've had so far two major challenges already to the Supreme Court in terms of constitutional aspects of the law. Uh, the most uh, dramatic at first was whether or not the law itself could stand, uh, in which it, uh, for the most part, was, although the Medicaid portion of the expansion was turned into a state option, as you all know. Uh, and so it really just highlights uh, the, the role of the three branches. But of course, making a law has been compared sometimes to this as well, which is uh, many of you have probably heard that there are two things you don't want to see. Uh, one is making sausage, which is what this is, and the other is uh, making a law, and that it is uh, quite a messy uh, process and uh, was uh, certainly something that having an opportunity to see that up close in terms of the, um, the Affordable Care Act uh, was a really uh, an education for me in terms of understanding the degrees to which uh, there are all sorts of contortions and changes that go on. And of course, we're following all this closely right now as there is an attempt to add an H to the, to the ACA. What I want to do as part of this talk is to also introduce a couple of characters who will help me tell the story a little bit about um, some of the ways that laws get made and the, ways, uh, uh, the role that research plays in, in some of this uh, process. And the first character I'm going to introduce is Marie Mitnick, who's uh, a, a staff member at uh, the National Academy of Medicine. She's someone who I had the benefit of getting uh, mentored by uh, when I was a Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellow in 2009 and 10. This program, which brings uh, mid-career professionals to Washington, has a sort of boot camp that is organized through the National Academy of Medicine in which they educate you about how policy kind of works in Washington and what's, what, what are some of those strategies. And so I'm going to play a clip uh, that I interviewed uh, Marie uh, to talk a little bit about um, how laws get made in Washington. The way we think about making policy in Washington, D.C. goes back to a very simple but very important recognition of who are the players. And the players can be easily described by using the paradigm of the Iron Triangle, which is the major stakeholders in shaping policy. And that's the Congress, the administration, and then all the constituency groups. Some people think of stakeholders as um, all of the major lobbying groups in Washington, D.C., but actually the Congress is a stakeholder and so is the administration. So when I think of stakeholders, I think of those three elements. If all three are in agreement, it's pretty much a slam dunk. If you can get the administration and the Congress and the major stakeholder groups, like I said, AARP, 
um, Families USA, some of our um, major American Hospital Association, the American Medical Association, um, you, our larger health policy groups to agree on something. Um, you pretty much get that initiated, and it happens. So, I think that's a really important aspect of all this, and in fact, it's something to bear in mind as we're watching uh, some of the work of the HCA unfold. Uh, many of you may have seen articles uh, in some of the newspapers today about how um, there is not currently alignment between some of the major stakeholders or many of the major stakeholders and the uh, Congress and the administration regard to the AHCA. And I think that's something to pay attention to as you watch uh, federal policy playing out and whether or not that uh, uh, serves as something of an Achilles heel as this administration tries to uh, work on uh, repealing uh, the ACA. I really want to highlight talking about stakeholders today because I think it's actually something that is um, underappreciated by many of us working in health services research when we're trying to influence uh, health policy. And I want to talk a little bit about not only who they are, but the kind of roles that they play so that you can try to understand them a little bit more and hopefully be able to work with them in ways that will um, help you be more influential through your work. First of all, I think it's critical to understand that when you're working on legislation, how actively engaged and a consistent basis the stakeholders are in this process. Uh, many people from academics may have uh, occasional opportunities to have contact or touches with people uh, working in health policy roles. Many of you may be perhaps as part of your professional organizations when they meet in Washington may have a Hill visit day or things like that in which you're at least exposed to some of that. But I, I want you to understand how much there is an active involvement of uh, individuals in this space on a regular basis. And what they are doing, uh, I think, is different than what I imagined uh, prior to working in Washington. There is an enormous amount of information brokering going on. Now, when I say information brokering, I don't mean that they're just they're pulling out the latest article from the New England Journal and quoting the, the p-values. But there is a variety of information, some of which does come from, um, from research and other of it which comes from other kinds of key information, and uh, as things like um, uh, uh, key personal stories that may come from uh, 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 the area in which the representative uh, is representing. Uh, it may also be uh, how other constituent groups are feeling about uh, different parts of a law and so forth. So they're reporting a lot not only about their own position and what fo uh, forms the basis of that opinion, but what their views are about how other groups are aligning or not aligning with them. And this is very important information that is being used by policy decision makers in trying to get a sense of whether or not an issue is reaching kind of a key moment in terms of whether there is uh, going to be backing uh, for a particular part of legislation. So they are, for certain, promoting their own position, but they are also providing a lot of uh, information about how they view the other stakeholders in the arena are, are um, aligning themselves vis-a-vis -vis, uh, certain parts of legislation as well. And I, I want to highlight for you that there are lots of different kinds of stakeholders, but there's absolutely become, in different fields like healthcare, certain groups that really rise to the top in terms of their consistency of visibility and impact through our government process. And none of this is meant to be an endorsement for me of that these are the right groups. It's just a descriptive fact of the reality of who, in fact, has tremendous uh, clout and control within the environment. So I'm going to ask Marita to sort of comment about this a little bit more. When I think about strategies for developing in, an influence in health policy, I think about the various influential groups in categories. And the most um, important categories are those that advise Congress on a regular basis and have long-time established relationships that are extremely influential. And good examples of those would be uh, in the professional society world, as I mentioned, the American Medical Association. Um, one that's particularly important to medical researchers is the American Association of Medical Colleges that is um, on a day-to-day -day basis working with members of Congress. Um, so the professional society type of, of orientation. Then I also think of some of the big voluntary health groups 
a number of them are extraordinarily tied into the policy making process. I think of the American Heart Association, the American Diabetes Association, the American Cancer Society. These are groups that have very sophisticated, very well-trained lobbyists um, that know how to make the process work. Um, then you think of the trade associations, um, like I mentioned pharma, uh, and then there's other, the American Hospital Association, the Federation of American Health Systems, uh, also organizations that work the Hill on a regular routine basis and have uh, great access um, to the high-level staff and understand how the place works. Um, finally, um, there's con Congress itself has advisory bodies. And those are formal advisory bodies that were set up to advise it in a nonpartisan way. And that includes the Congressional Research Service that will turn to research information to formulate its um, summary documents for the Hill, which is the basis for a lot of their uh, communication about what an issue is really about. Uh, the same thing is true with the Congressional Budget Office. The Congressional Budget Office is the organization that will come up with legislative options. Actually, they'll develop options for Congress to consider in various budgetary approaches that they're taking to, for example, a Medicare issue. We also have in this country, uh, because of the diffusion of power, a very important phenomenon called think tanks. And these think tanks have very close relations with health policy makers in Washington, D.C. And some of them are politically oriented in their nature, but many of them are nonpartisan uh, and do really good analytic work as well. Um, not that the partisan ones don't do very good analytic work too, but think tanks like uh, the first one in Washington was the Brookings Institute, You've also got the Urban Institute, you've got the Heritage Foundation, you've got the Center for American Progress. Um, some of those have more of a political leaning than others, but think tanks are something that we often don't think about in the academic world. And they use the material that academicians generate to create their work, to advise legislators, for example, on policy issues, or advise political parties on policy issues. So I would keep the think tanks in mind as well. So the key of what Marie is saying there is that there are these groups that are in fact positioned on a regular basis communicating with federal policymakers. And these are the individuals who have the attention of policymakers that you have an opportunity through your research to potentially influence, but it's going to take active steps to be able to do that. Now again, what, what is it, who are these information brokers talking to and, 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 and what are they doing in that process? Well, one is they're very effective at not just sort of randomly talking to members of Congress, but they are, tip, they are very honed in on the, the, uh, the committees of jurisdiction related to specific legislation. So uh, in, in the House of Representatives, for example, uh, there are basically two main committees that oversee most of what you would think about as related to federal health care policy, the Energy and Commerce Committee, and Ways and Means. Uh, the, these, these are two critical uh, committees, and on the uh, Senate side, it would be the, the Help Committee as well as the Senate Finance Committee. And these committees are critical because uh, these committees is where the work gets done. This is where the majority of the staff are accumulated who develop deep expertise around of the legislative activity. I want to emphasize as well that when uh, these uh, information brokers, these uh, lobbying groups and so forth are engaging, of course they are occasionally engaging with the policymaker themselves, but they're often engaged with the staff and they are formulating relationships with those staff uh, in, in a key way and they are, as I'm mentioning, they're also formulating relationships with other key stakeholders in this uh, position, uh, in, in this space. And it's this coalescing, coalescing and how they come together and formulate their, uh, their message together that in fact ultimately can carry a lot of weight uh, in influencing uh, the policy process. What they are doing more than anything else is something that you do in your everyday life, which is that they're focusing on forming a relationship and becoming someone that can become a reliable resource for that staff member and the policymaker so that they are relying on what humans 
are driven by in their everyday life, which is a relationship and someone who, in fact, can be trusted as a source of information. So more than anything else, they are working to build trust and credibility on their issue. And how do they do that? Well, they do that in part by not just coming in and promoting their own work. I think many times researchers think, oh, but my goal must be that I'm an expert on a particular study that I did. I need to go tell someone about that and give them the exact answer. What you really need to be doing is to developing expertise in your area so that you can become a resource. Of course, there are ways that you would weave in and think about the relevance of your research to that topic area. But if you're only seen as promoting your own work, that's not a particularly helpful resource uh, for a policymaker. So it, you very much need to see yourself as a broad uh, resource in, in that area. It's also very important to do something that is very hard in many times to think about the balance of your work in academics versus what goes on in the policy world which is that you're typically formulating a plan when you're having these meetings and then have to have the ability to follow up on that. And this is difficult because the time course of what is expected in the policy sphere versus what your expectations are of your other responsibilities in academics can make this very difficult to do. Um, and also, you really got to be able to drop you know, everything if you're called upon to be able to do that. And if you can't do that, then you're not the dependable friend or resource that they need to be able to work with. So more than anything else, it's about committing to a relationship if you're going to engage in this kind of work. And to really sort of hammer that home, uh, this is uh, Andy Schneider, someone I got to work with on the Energy and Commerce Committee. This, this individual here is probably responsible for about 75 to 80 percent of everything we know about federal Medicaid law today. He, he worked for Henry Waxman for about 25 years. And this is what he has to say about um, uh, the, the, the relationship uh, with, with people. You can establish a personal relationship with the staffer where the staffer sees you as somebody that is a high value that they can use, you know, not in a bad sense, but use in working together to advance a common a policy agenda, um, that you're the go-to person on this issue for them, um, that can be very helpful to having you. For, from your standpoint of, of making your research make a difference, it can of course be helpful to the staffer uh, and the members who he or she works for um, in helping them um, make the policy changes that they came to Congress to enact and that they want credit for. So it can be a win-win. Um, and um, you know, when you go into these, these conversations, just in part think about this could be a long-term relationship um, and that you're going to need some of those at some point along the way if you're looking for legislative change because it just takes too long for um, everything to line up in the right way. And even then you still need luck. <laughs> you sure do. Um, so. You know, and what are the ways that that relationship can advance, just like other relationships in, in, in your life? Well, you know, one is that you may be called upon, you heard him say, you know, you could be, you, you know, could be useful to the staffer. Well, you could be useful that you might be called upon as a witness in a hearing in which you would then have an opportunity to have a very visible role in, in a public way of being able to comment directly to the public as well as to policymakers about an issue. There is absolutely the case that uh, people uh, get engaged in the actual uh, drafting of language that might then ultimately get incorporated into legislative language. The involvement of these different information brokers and, uh, and stakeholder groups will actually show up with language and say, here, here's some suggested ideas. And of course, that relationship can be the basis of whether or not the staffer would feel comfortable with the idea of potentially using that. And then, and then there's fundamentally, you know, there's the possibility of, of saying, well, maybe you need to come into government to see if you can be more effective in bringing about the kinds of changes that, that go on. And that was, uh, to some extent, some of my own experience of having first done this work as a health services researcher, then done, doing this as a fellow uh, through the, the Robert Johnson uh, Health Policy Program, as John mentioned in, in his introduction of me. I did have the opportunity to then start to think about, well, I, maybe I want to work behind the curtain for a little while. Are there some opportunities of trying to make a difference in policy in that way? And this was also quite an education for me, and I think there are some useful things that I wanted to share with you about that process. I mean, absolutely, that being on the inside within the policy sphere does give you greater access to people who are making uh, decisions. Uh, but um, 
it's also uh, gives you insight as, as stepping outside of your world often does to realize that once you're on the inside, you get even a stronger sense of how powerful the voices are on the outside and what influence they can have on the process. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that uh, in a moment. But I bring that up because I think sometimes maybe trying to work from the outside to influence health policy, people are thinking, oh, how can I do that and have an impact when there's all these powerful voices from the inside that are actually controlling things? And I want to reassure you that by aligning with some of the kinds of organizations we've been talking about, there's tremendous influence to be had uh, uh, fr from the outside. And then the other thing that's very really visible as a researcher moving to the inside is all the missed opportunities to take advantage of the research that's out there. And that it, it, it's, I want to emphasize that research is absolutely used and incorporated into decision making, but not in this a way that would always be uh, in, in the arrangement that you would ideally love it to see happen, and that there are missed opportunities uh, to uh, have good uh, information available in a timely way that could really influence the kinds of decisions that go on. One of the things that's really striking from moving to the inside is the degree to which my mindset changed from what maybe I had been taught in an earlier phase in my career, which was Gee, you're a health services researcher. Do the important work you think, uh, do the things that you think are important. And when the health policy window of opportunity happens to open, be prepared to run through with your work to try to see if you can make a difference. And there are occasional times when I have been standing in the right place at the right time that, that things have lined up that way. But what I came to see by working on the inside is that there are many more predictable cycles that we have to learn more about in our work as researchers that there are a, a, a greater awareness of when certain pieces of legislation are going to naturally sunset or have to be reauthorized, provide the natural windows of when there are going to be times that something has to be written to continue that program and that there are ways to be anticipating when that's going to happen and to develop your research to be, uh, be able to comment and contribute to decisions that might happen around that. Similarly, there are cycles related on the executive branch side to writing of certain periodic regulations that will come up that, again, if you can anticipate these things, you can conduct your research in a way that's uh, getting ready for that and is, it can influence that process in a much more predictable way. And so that's really what I think has been, again, something that has been under-recognized in, in many cases in the academic sphere. We, we're sort of, in, in many cases, doing our things either in response to something we learn about after the fact and are trying to catch up, rather than looking a little bit more prospectively about when decisions are coming up and trying, and trying to influence that. Clearly, trying to do some of this within certain uh, ways, like the regulatory process, are going to be constrained by the statute that guides those regulations. But you can still have a very substantial uh, impact on, on things that go on uh, through the research process. So I want to talk you through a, a case study, if you will, of one that I was involved with when I was uh, working at ASPE. And this had to do with uh, a Medicare rule. And uh, uh, specifically, it had to do with uh, work that I was doing related to chronic care management. So each year, CMS, which oversees the Medicare program, writes regulations to update its fee-for-service payment uh, codes. And the purpose of this is primarily because new procedures get invented each year and they need to figure out what they're going to pay for delivering the service that way and so forth. For several years, uh, physicians have been saying, have been pointing out that, gee, you know, a lot of clinical care has kind of moved into email and telephone calls and a variety of non-face-to-face -face related activities shouldn't we have service payment co codes related to those activities? And CMS continued to sort of grapple with that idea. Uh, they were sort of wanting to be responsive to the stakeholders related to this, but also had some anxiety about, well, would this open up kind of a, a Pandora's box where there could be a lot of uh, unexpected spending and might there be more fraud because people could claim that they're doing this activity, but there wouldn't be the kinds of documentation that would go along with other kinds of face-to-face -face activities and so forth. So um, when I first got to uh, ASPE, this was something that was being talked about. And then momentum was building over a period of time to sort of finally say, let's write a regulation to think about how to do this. And the one area that they were willing to sort of take the first bite of the apple, if you will, related to this, 
was in the area of chronic care management, that is taking care of people who have chronic illnesses. And to sort of give you a sense of like how the different stakeholder groups aligned around this kind of issue, you had the AMA, which was really gung-ho on the idea of trying to open up the door to pay for this non-face-to-face -face activity. They were excited about doing this for chronic care, but really saw this as getting the foot in the door for perhaps a wider array of non-face-to-face -face activities that they could, uh, physicians could be able to bill for. Um, you have an, an entity like MedPAC, which is one of these advisory bodies to Congress uh, that um, was interested in this idea but really wanted to make sure that the service would be targeted in a relatively narrow way so that it could be perhaps um, the increased expense associated with paying for non-face-to-face -face activity could be offset by reducing hospital admissions or other kinds of services uh, that would be prevented by uh, the physician being able to communicate with the, being paid to communicate with the patient in a non-face-to-face way. You had primary care groups uh, like the family practitioners and the general internists who were also very excited about the idea of a chronic care management code because they saw this as finally maybe a new source of revenue to make up for some of the pay gap differences between primary care and specialty care. And of course, when the specialty care groups heard about this, they were very eager to get involved in this, this work as well and didn't want to be left out of, of, of this opportunity. They said, after all, we answer phone calls and do uh, email as well. So here I was as someone working as an insider within ASPE and had uh, really uh, the responsibility given to me of, of writing a lot of the language associated uh, with, with this regulation. And um, I certainly uh, recognized the issues that were being raised by those different stakeholder groups. I also th thought that from my understanding of some of the research literature that the chances of being able to deliver this service were probably uh, more likely to be effective if they were being done in an office environment that had capacities to actually deliver the service in terms of uh, personnel and IT supports and other things that would actually make it possible to support uh, patients with chronic care through models like the patient-centered uh, medical home type models and wondered about whether that kind of certification of a practice might be the kind of practice that we would want to allow to build this service so that we weren't just spending more money for something that wasn't in fact delivering a higher level of service. I also worried quite a bit about Medicare has a requirement uh, that there's a 20% copayment for its services, for, for its physician services, and, um, but there is an exemption for that if a service is uh, characterized as a preventive service. And so I thought, gee, if we had a copayment associated with payments for non-face-to-face -face activity, that might create a barrier in terms of patients being interested and in, in understanding what this service was all about, that they might start getting bills for things and not understanding it, and that in fact it might be a barrier to their, their ultimately receiving the care. The main thing, though, that I really want to emphasize for you is that I had perspectives. Some of those perspectives were informed by research. And I think I had a kind of a simplistic idea in my head but that by going into the government and working within ASPE, I was going to be in this really strong position to tell CMS what the right way to do this was. And what I learned is pretty quickly is that even as an insider within HHS, really what I turned out to be was just another stakeholder in a sense. That I guess I had special access to be able to communicate with great regularity to people working in CMS about this but that a lot of the strategies that were critical to be able to be successful in trying to bring about change as someone outside of government were the same kinds of strategies I had to use inside government. That is, I had to build relationships with the people at CMS with whom I was trying to convince that this would be you know, how we should write this regulation and so forth. And I had to really commit to the relationship in terms of being available, being responsive to the kinds of needs that are there. Again, these aren't um, this isn't rocket science, but it does speak to the degree to which uh, we sometimes forget about the social component that is involved with change. That isn't just about laying out facts and saying, isn't it obvious, don't you know what to do now? But it's very much about nurturing people and helping them to feel that they are part of a process and that you're uh, in a trusting relationship with them that they can bring about that change. And working as someone within government, it's such a, you know, we tend to think about it like we do anything that isn't us as kind of a homogeneous thing. In fact, HHS is a gigantic 
complex organization with mul multiple points of view and uh, multiple parties who are working and not always rowing in the same direction. And so as working within inside of government requires, in fact, a lot of the same kinds of strategies that are involved outside of government. And one of the most important aspects, I think, of this is really getting to the heart of how people arrive at what truth is in the world that we all know within academics versus how truth is arrived at in a world like policy. And it really is very different. So, of course, we are driven as scientists to uh, ge uh, generate hypotheses and to test those uh, using you know, rigorous uh, statistical tests and, and so forth to arrive at a single set of facts. That is what we strive for. What goes on very much in the policy context is really trying to arrive at consensus among trusted stakeholder groups that different entities will make their different arguments and then ultimately decision makers will try to gauge where along that spectrum they think the truth lies. It's maybe how we sometimes used to think about the news where they would array people with different political points of view or whatnot and who would tell the story and then you as a viewer would try to gauge where you think the truth is along that spectrum or who you align yourself with to uh, determine what you think the truth is. And policy making really works out much more along those lines. And so what's going on is that uh, I, as one example of a stakeholder coming from ASPE, was then in competition in a sense with the AMA, with the primary care groups, with the specialist groups and others that were weighing in about this policy. And uh, I didn't have necessarily any kind of special way that I was viewed compared to CMS. Again, I had a lot of attention being given to me because I was, and I could, dial people up with great regularity, but so could these stakeholder groups as well. It wasn't clear to me that I was speaking to CMS any uh, more frequently or less frequently than the AMA was, for example, on, on this particular policy. And so these groups are forming relationships and are, are kind of working on trying to um, uh, 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 bend and, 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 and meet the needs of the ultimate customer, in this case, writing a regulation for CMS ar around this work. And I think it's understanding this way that truth is arrived at by policymakers is really critical. I think we, many of us, talk about like we want to get to evidence-based policy. And I think the truth is that's a really large cultural shift from where a lot of policy decision making currently happens. Now those stakeholders who are arrayed along different points of view, many of them will rely on research as the way that they're making their argument. But it isn't that the research evidence is all laid out in some kind of systematic way that allows the policymaker at the end of the day to make their decision. So in this particular case, how did we resolve some of these differences? Well, it, we, you know, to deal with uh, non-face-to-face billing, it was ultimately approved as, as a regulation to sort of narrow some of the concerns that MedPAC had about that this being sort of a, 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 a targeted activity, yet still meeting the needs of the AMA to allow for non-face-to-face -face billing. It was limited to beneficiaries who had two or more chronic conditions. Uh, the idea was raised about maybe this should be targeted toward um, certain specialties. Actually, this is an example of where regulations are constrained by um, by the statute. The statute in terms of payment within CMS basically says that if there's a payment code, anyone who's allowed to bill can use that payment code. You can't write a regulation that says the following specialties can bill uh, for, for this activity. However, uh, there was incorporated into the, the regulation that, well, to get the patients to buy into this, maybe you can only start billing this once they have undergone with their provider an annual wellness visit. And given those visits tend to be done by primary care providers, that perhaps steered uh, more of this service being delivered by primary care physicians than by, uh, by specialist physicians. Third, uh, there was uh, a lot of broad-based interest among the stakeholders for the idea of waiving the 20% copayment and trying to have this service labeled as preventive care. But at the end of the day, there are uh, many lawyers who uh, uh, represent HHS and determine, uh, interpret basically the statute and basically decided that this uh, service did not meet the requirements of the statute of what preventive care was. And so ultimately, it was not possible to waive the 20% copayment. And then finally, uh, this idea of having the payment limited to practices that met the criteria for a patient-centered medical home uh, 
CMS had a lot of enthusiasm for this idea, but at the end of the day, they felt limited in their ability to execute on that because they did not have clarity in their own minds about what standards should be adopted for what a patient-centered medical home was. This is an example of where research, by having lots of different models being tested out there, and the, and the scientific research community not having clear consensus on what constitutes a patient-centered medical home left the policymakers with their hands sort of being thrown up and saying, we don't know how to define this uh, with enough specificity, we don't know what the standards are, and we don't even know that we have the resources to monitor this to make sure that they are meeting those standards. The only thing that they felt that they could get data related to was because they were administering the uh, program related to meaningful use electronic health records, they said, okay, you at least have to have that as, uh, as part of your practice to make sure that that's one element of having capacity to be able to deliver this service. So I, I, I share this just as a way of showing the kinds of compromises that evolve from different perspectives of stakeholders rela related to a policy. And reflecting on this in terms of uh, uh, researchers, you know, I guess what I would say is that as a group, we are superb at being creative and generating new knowledge. Uh, but unfortunately, throughout pretty much that entire process that I was describing to you, and I, I didn't tell you the full duration of it, actually played out probably over about a two and a half year process. So even though that's an annual regulation, we wrote it for one year, and the first year, um, the, the, the resolution of it was that we were taking this seriously, and you should look in the next year that we're probably gonna take the more concrete step related to it. So it took more than two years for it to fully play out. But throughout that entire time, there was very little visible involvement of researchers. And, I'm, and the kind of researchers I would have expected maybe to show up might have been those who were interested in things like patient-centered medical homes or had relevant data related to what is the best way to model and pay for uh, care related to, to uh, individuals with, with, with chronic care needs. And some of that may be the lack of, of clarity that comes out to the research community about what regulations and policies are being considered because after all these things are sort of posted in the federal register which is um, a little bit more tricky than trying to read your phone book, um, if you know what a phone book is anymore. Uh, but um, the, uh, you know, so that's really a difficult um, uh, 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 communication device that is not really easily accessible, uh, typically for many in, in academic. Um, I, I guess I would say that, uh, so th th there was a lack of visibility in terms of researchers on this, and that our tendency you know, in general related to our research is to sort of expect the end users, whether that be CMS or anyone else, to sort of find our work somehow and know how to assemble it and apply it. And, you know, I was certainly trying to do that as an insider within, uh, uh, working within the government, but it's, it's, it's very tricky, particularly to be able to communicate the nuance uh, to policymakers related to the fact of why is it that the intervention can look so different in this study versus this other one, even though we may conceptually think that they're quite related in terms of what we're looking at, the details being different are really uh, challenging, I think, for policymakers to understand how to uh, turn that into standards and, and to turn that into actual policy. You know, in many times when we say to researchers, hey, you've got to go further with your work uh, to, to make sure that it's, it's, it's picked up and visible, I think many people go in their own minds to the idea of, oh, you mean got to get it covered in the media in addition to getting it into the journal. And of course, that's an important step, but again, that is highly insufficient other than trying to raise some general awareness around an issue. It, it really is insufficient when it comes time to, to do the, the detailing related to how to, to implement a particular activity. And I think what we're really missing is engagement in a significant way with policymakers. And given the challenge I've raised about trying to do this with policymakers, if you can't do it yourselves because of the requirement of the consistency of the, the relationship building, then at least trying to do this through key stakeholders to help carry the message in a way that you think is, is most important. This, this is a photograph I took on a, on a building in, in London a while back, and, and, it, and, and I sort of thought about this when I, when I got to ARC, that I thought a lot of what researchers do as their dissemination strategy has a lot of the poetic beauty of kind of blowing bubbles uh, in, into the air and hoping that they land exactly in the right place and someone knows what it is and what to do with it. And occasionally they do, but unfortunately this is an extremely inefficient way to ultimately translate research into policy. And we need to develop much more active participatory type models 
of turning our research and connecting it with policymakers. And that really means um, identifying who the key policymakers and stakeholders are and, and really trying to build consensus among those stakeholders related to the work that we're doing. And this obviously takes time as well and is not something that is natural to many of us in, in the research community, but we cannot expect this stuff to be self-assembled at the next stages. I'm telling you there is a very professional group of people who have these communication skills who are active in this space and the reason that their messages are getting across more effectively than our messages is because they are committing to that communication um, uh, uh, aspect of, of what this is all about. And if we want to really improve this process, we need to figure out how to engage with them. I think we have principles for how to do this. And many of you know the principles of community-based participatory research. Many of us think about that as how we engage with community-based groups. That's very important. But I think the same principles can be applied to working with policymakers and with working with some of these key stakeholders to make sure, again, that our messages are developed in a shared way with them and that we have an ability to make sure that they are part of what is being messaged uh, but when these stakeholders are engaged uh, with policymakers. Ultimately, you know, it, this is a very uh, protracted process to try to influence policy. It, it is not simple, but you know, the reality is it isn't simple to change clinical practice either. Uh, we know how long it can take from evidence about how to improve clinical practice and getting it into uh, real life change. That, you know, th these same timelines of many, many years are true around the political process as well. And you need to be um, cognizant of that and ready to commit to that if you want to do this kind of work. Um, you have to also understand that, uh, that if you're working in policy, unlike when we work in science when we're aiming for the single best solution, that many times reaching a policy solution requires some kind of compromise and set of how you get to consensus among multiple groups, as I was showing you with the chronic care management solution. That was not the ideal solution in my mind, but it was a step forward on what was otherwise available to us. And I think something that we're all cognizant of today is that um, something that really feels different in the political sphere as compared to what goes on in medical care. You know, medical care for me, when uh, you know, I would round on the wards with the residents, we'd make a decision about the patient after examining the patient and looking at all the information and so forth, we'd make a decision and we'd move forward on the plan that day. And we didn't revisit and revisit that plan over and over again. Obviously, if the patient uh, you know, had some complication, we would revisit it and so forth. But there is something remarkable about the political process that allows issues to be visited and revisited. And I think a lot of what we're all kind of getting a bit of whiplash around right now is that after you know, seven years of the ACA, are we now about to revisit all these things and we're going to throw that away and start in another direction? And this can be either energizing or demoralizing depending on where you are in the political spectrum. But you need to anticipate that and recognize that democracy is a messy process, uh, but that we have to engage in it if we're going to, in fact, try to make a difference. You know, in terms of you know, recommendations I would make for you around doing this work, I think that uh, you know, I have used a lot of examples here around uh, the federal uh, health policy process, but there are lots of issues where it's more relevant to talk about state health policy or local health policy. And I think you really need to think about that level that's appropriate for you. If you're interested in low-income people then, uh, and you're trying to help and improve their care, well, then state Medicaid policy turns out to be extremely important with regard to that. And you don't necessarily have to uh, worry about how often can I free myself up to fly to Washington and so forth. Um, I would also say that if, if you have certain constraints, like that you need to be in a particular area, that you can develop the kinds of skills that I'm referencing here through your work with local and state uh, of policy makers and in fact a lot of those skills will translate very well when you do have opportunities or are interested in getting involved in, in federal health policy. So I think those communication skills which are different about arriving at truth through the policy process through our, versus our scientific process are really important to sort of develop at a local level if, if, you're, if that's more available to you as you start to think about uh, moving up in this area. So after all of that, I guess you might wonder, why would anyone get involved in all this? It sounds so messy. So I'm going to close by having one of my colleagues, Molly Cook, who some of you may know, who's a general internist at UCSF, talk a little bit about this. I've found it just incredibly gratifying 
uh, to have had the opportunity to play the role that I have played with the American College, but also other things that I've done over my career that have a policy dimension. I started medical school thinking of myself uh, purely as a one-on-one -on -one clinician. And I, I still love uh, clinical work, but at the, at the end of a busy day, I might have seen 16 patients. When you're working at a policy level, uh, you can make contributions that affect hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, and so just the, the scale of it is, um, it's, it, it's exciting um, and it's very gratifying. And I think across the board in this uh, country, you know, extending out to areas I know essentially nothing about, uh, policy needs to be informed. That policy is going to get made whether or not there's an evidence base for it, because the policymakers and politicians you know, have to take action. And so, to the extent we can help them make better policy rather than bad policy, that's, a, it, that's an enormous uh, contribution. And I have just found it uh, really incredibly rewarding. So I'm gonna end there and say thank you. And I really would welcome your comments and thoughts. And uh, I guess I, I just really wanna close by saying at a time in which um, science is perhaps being challenged, that people are raising questions about the role of research, uh, particularly as it relates perhaps to health policy. I think it couldn't be more important than ever for uh, people to engage in this work and to use the power of science and research as a way to in fact raise important questions about what our policy should be. It's not uh, always linear, uh, but I do think that there are skills that can be acquired and I think there are partnerships we need to seek out but we can really make a difference, all of us. And I know many of you are already engaged in this process, and I just want to encourage you to continue the great work you're doing. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Byman. Um, you mentioned the AMA and the AAMC, taking things a step back. What do you think is the best way for us to have our voices heard by those organizations? Right, so you know, I think the, the inroads to the specific organizations that you might engage with are sometimes influenced by your own specialty, by some relationships that you might have opportunities to develop along the ways. You know, clearly what it's going to be involved in any of these is showing that you are not just a one-time person showing up and lobbying an idea over the fence and hoping that it sticks. They're looking for people who are engaged and committed and working with them in, in particular ways. And, you know, I, I can understand with certain organizations people may feel uh, uncomfortable about whether they want to see themselves aligned with them and whether the philosophy is with them. And you have to make your choices around those. But I do think that Whichever organizations you seek to try to align with, you need to think about it as the, the level of, a, of making a serious commitment. And not everyone has to have you know, the relationships with every one of these organizations that we're talking about. On the other hand, I think it's critical for you to understand, and I guess I would challenge all of us in our work and the things that we care about, have we done our homework to really understand who the key stakeholders are that are currently engaged in that? And who are the key stakeholders who could become engaged in that? And what ways could you influence them through um, taking the time to involve them in uh, learning about the kinds of questions they have about the policy, how to uh, have them be part of the process that you're doing in research, that you're not just showing up after the fact and saying, hi, I'm really smart and I have an answer for you and you really ought to do something with it. It's clearly about involving them and that's why I bring up the model of community-based participatory research where you're engaging at a much earlier part and in fact having multiple touches al along the way. So, um, you know, I, I guess I would say find organizations that you feel comfortable about starting to do that but also be very strategic in understanding who are the key stakeholders for the issues that matter to you and that you're trying to be, that could be influential in carrying your research forward? 
sounds kind of daunting for any individual. And you know, we do have some individuals here. You know, Mark Fender is probably the best example. People who have actually made a long-term commitment to this. But to what extent do you think an organization like IHPI could actually become the sort of consistent, long-term, you know, develop the relationship as an organization, but then people within it could actually sort of you know, fit the fit the need. I, I think that's exactly right on, Tim, and, and so I, I think, you know, I, I can only speak to my own uh, institution. I know less about, uh, you know, I've, I've learned some here today, but, you know, a lot of the contacts with uh, government and with key stakeholder groups are, in our environment, are typically dominated by the relationships that are formed through our hospital or our, our clinical enterprise. And they haven't always been assembled for how do we harvest and cultivate the power of our research faculty and making that information connected. And I think it is a tremendous opportunity to think about using your academic unit as a platform for building these relationships and then knowing how to tap various faculty members depending on the issues that arise and, and to have a timely way of being aware of what are the state health policy issues that are rising to the surface, what are the federal health policy levels. I think part of it is that we don't have great communication pathways typically to many of our faculty so they even know that there's a timely issue coming up or what these cycles are. And so I think it's a, a great thing that you're talking about and we're having conversations at UCSF within our Institute for Health Policy Studies of doing very much what you're talking about, which is developing more of a platform for that engagement that is aligned for really thinking about what is the expertise of the faculty and how we, do we plug them in and make them more generally aware of the policy cycles that are coming up. So I, I think that's a wonderful opportunity. Yeah, John. So Andy, thanks very much for a great presentation and really helping to energize us in thinking about how we can have the impact that you've had and, and, and describing the process for doing so. I really appreciate Tim's question because with our impact accelerator, this is very much what we're trying to do, but it's a growing process. We've invested a lot in you know, having a director of government relations in Washington, D.C., working with the rest of the university's government relations team here on campus and in Lansing, and having a strong media presence as well so stakeholders can find us when the issues come up. Um, I have a question going back to Marie McNick's yeah. earlier point about the Iron Triangle and yes. the role of stakeholders. And we know when the ACA was enacted, the Obama administration and Congress worked very hard to get the AMA and the health insurance plans and pharmaceutical industry and the hospital industry on board before they move forward. And, and you know, today we've seen a vote where all those major stakeholders were either silent or strongly opposed yep. to the AHCA. And how do you see that playing out going forward as this moves to the Senate now? Well, I, 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 I tried to raise that. I think it's a, an incredibly important question, and I do think that this could come back to bite um, the, the attempts by the Republicans to repeal the law. Because I do think these stakeholders are now, you know, maybe partly they were uh, seeing if they could keep their powder dry because maybe in fact the House was never even going to get its act together to pass this thing in the first place. Now that in fact it's crept forward, I think you're going to see the stakeholders more energized than ever and really focused on the Senate. Uh, where first of all it's a bigger climb anyway uh, because it tends to be a more moderate body uh, because of the 60 vote uh, typical requirement there. Um, so uh, I think they're going to be very energized and, and, and you're going to see that, that play out. So um, yeah, I think it's pretty hard to pass stuff without having the stakeholders in, engaged uh, in, in this way. And so um, uh, it'll be very interesting to see that and it's probably an, an incredibly important time if you have relationships with some of these key stakeholders to feed them whatever that you, you think would be helpful for them to understand about uh, ways of trying to communicate uh, what, what, what the impact of perhaps repealing the law would be or, or things like that. So um, yeah, it, it, I think it's quite interesting. I mean, we, we saw, for example, in the House that they tried to ignore all, you know, many inputs, right? They didn't even get another CBO estimate prior to the, to the vote today. So um, uh, you, you're going to see, I think, a lot of uh, the stakeholders becoming, I think, more visible as this moves to the Senate. Yeah. Hey, Dr. Biden, uh, oh, sorry. Hi, uh, jo oh, there Josh, you are. <laughs> Josh Rubin with the uh, Department of Learning and Sciences here at UM. Hi. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming and speaking with us. You ended on this really beautiful note that if you, know, if you could influence, if you could shape policy in good ways, you could touch hundreds of thousands, you know, maybe millions of lives. I guess as, as someone who was, uh, you, you know, when you were in charge of a, an agency that did a lot of funding of research at ARC, um, the question I have is, I feel like there's a, there's a disconnect. You see how 
I mean, the people voting to, to fund NIH, fund our, policymakers are voting every year to, to, to fund and hopefully increase funds for NIH and ARC and these agencies that, that fund a lot of the research. And you spent a lot of your presentation showing this, how challenging it is to get research to influence policy. Is there any changes that you can envision in, in how funding works that would sort of structure things so that folks that do research, instead of just applying them for the next grant, would have an incentive? You know, they, they publish it in a journal where it, does, where it takes 17 years to get in the practice. That it doesn't get in language that the patients can understand. It doesn't get in the media. It doesn't get in in the policies. Can you see a change in research that would allow for more um, use of the the good research to generate to get back to help the policymakers make better policy. Yeah, so I, I think there's a couple of, of, of things there. So first of all, I, you know, it's like the old psychiatry joke that uh, you know it's easier to change people only if they want to change, right? So uh, right now, you know, w w if we're just saying from the academic side, hey, you should be doing evidence-based policy, that's a one-way conversation if the policymakers aren't saying they're interested in that. So that, that's a that's a a process that we need to work on over time. But I think there is also embedded in your comment, I think health services research in general has struggled from uh, not making enough of a commitment of connecting its work with any end users, right? And so, other than other researchers, right? And so I, I think many of us see the relevance of our work for lots of end users, but we don't develop the questions in partnership with these end users and we don't conduct the work in a way that in fact helps them anticipate that it's coming and that they should want the answer and they could do something with it. And so I think we have to really rethink and, and, and certainly in my role at ARC, a big part of what I felt was critical was to try to think about who are the stakeholders for the kind of work that ARC could fund and how do we in fact make that connection stronger. And uh, I do see, for example, uh, the, the health systems like here at the University of Michigan and others as being a critical uh, stakeholder that could be uh, benefiting from the kinds of work that goes on from, from many of you. And we need to learn from the questions that they have and making sure that our answers are provided back because the most powerful thing that's secure, the reason that the NIH is more successful, for example, than ARC is at, at getting their funding, in my mind, a big part of it is that they are much more successful at, at, at working with stakeholders who are then able to go to Congress to say, how that important work has made a difference for them. The main stakeholders that Health Services Research has going to Congress saying that is, the, is Academy Health, which is a lovely organization, but is another research group basically advocating for researchers. And it's not people who would make the end use of our research saying, without this, we would not be able to run our business in a particular way, or we wouldn't be able to improve uh, clinical care and, and, and so forth. We need to figure out that connection of our work if we expect to be able to get the kinds of uh, investments that we think are necessary for, for our field. So I think this idea of connecting with end users relates to policy, and that's what I tried to highlight today. But I think it's also relevant for our connections with practice. I think we are not strongly enough connected with that. And I think there is an opportunity for that with some of the work that's going on with transforming our health systems from healthcare organizations to learning organizations. Okay, sure. Um, so I really like this idea of researchers thinking about how to align ourselves with influential stakeholders. But when you think about your influential stakeholder, many of them are not neutral in the way that I think of community-based uh, practice research. Um, and so when your, uh, when your stakeholder, your influential stakeholder might be someone who has more of either a partisan or for-profit uh, uh, you know, set, set of uh, incentives, you know, how do you think about integrating that to research in a way that will feel good to you as a researcher as well as if you are submitting an application to ARC that won't be sort of negatively perceived as influencing the research in an inappropriate way? Well, look, this is a really tricky issue, right? The idea, I, I hope no one is hearing me as prepare yourself to sell out your idea so that in fact you can get yourself funded. That's not what I am advocating for. What I'm saying is that first of all, you need to understand these organizations and what motivates them. Because in fact, there will often be many more points of agreement than you might initially believe to be the case. And it's not like organizations don't evolve in their own thinking as well if you can provide them with information. And I'm not, again, there will be a difference across organizations in terms of their willingness and readiness to do that. But it seems to me, and I, I just know this from my own experience of the, of the professional organizations I'm connected with, I see 
how rarely it is that the members of these organizations and their research findings are actually connected to the policy statements of, the, of these organizations. That in fact, it's sort of a separate world. It's kind of similar to what we see in, in our clinical life, where there's kind of the clinical stuff going over here, and we've got this research stuff over here, and rarely are we actually doing the work of integrating it together in ways that we're learning from that. So I guess I would say that um, you know, you have to sort of reach out and connect with these groups to figure out where you think they're coming from. You may, in fact, decide you're going to walk away. You may decide that they aren't willing to do this on terms that would feel comfortable to you. But I think we're just not extending our hands often enough to even know how often it might be possible to do that. And I think there's just a lot more points of, of mutual engagement that are possible. It doesn't mean that you are lock, stock, and barrel buying into all of their policy agenda, but I do think there are ways that you could find hooks that could be valuable to you. And again, I would start with just being strategic of thinking about your issue and what are, who are the stakeholder groups that are relevant for the issue that you care about. And I do this exercise with great regularity with uh, my, my fellows. And I'm, I'm often uh, surprised by how challenging it can be for people to sort of first start to think about it that way. And I think it's a critical step to understand who's actually really in the arena influencing what you're trying to influence and realizing what you're up against and, and how you're going to find yourself to be able to align and, and work with some of those. Because though, as, as, as Molly Cook said at the end, this stuff is going to be happening with or without you. So the question is, how do you find yourself of getting onto the train? And I'm not saying abandon your scientific rigor and so forth, but I do think there's tremendous value and opportunities there. And I would say there's enormous learning as well to realize the degree to which there is nuance to issues that, some, you know, that I have been learned so much by engaging with end users to understand either their data better or some aspects of what the constraints they feel about their issues. So it, it is challenging. I do think that models like you're, you're doing here of creating a platform to make it easier and figuring out what parts can be done easier together is a critical step. But uh, I think individually, everyone should really start to think about mapping who the key stakeholders are for them. And that would be something that would probably be helpful back for your organization to then know how to think about engaging them. Well, I want to thank you, Andy, very much for a very stimulating presentation and discussion. I want to thank everybody for attending and invite you to stay for a reception afterwards to chat with colleagues and with Andy before he heads to the airport back to San Francisco. And Andy, as a token or a memento of our appreciation, I want to present you with some IHPI swag. All right. <laughs> and, uh, thank you. This, this will help you stay well hydrated for the next drought in Fantastic. California. Fantastic. Wow. Awesome. And it's in the Michigan colors. I really appreciate that. And now that I'm not in the government, I can accept it. So. <laughs> that gets well so under the gift. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it.